Pope Francis calls for talks and an end to the war in Ukraine. Comments rebuffed by Kyiv, but welcomed in Moscow. The war, which has cost thousands of lives, continues with little movement by either side. Should Ukraine talk or fight on? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Jonah Hull. The war in Ukraine has cost tens of thousands of lives and rages on just over two years after Russia's invasion. Ukrainian forces are fighting with weapons supplied by the West in what's become the largest military engagement against Russian forces in Europe since World War II. Some say the fighting is at a stalemate, but the conflict remains a volatile danger in the heart of Europe. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has again warned the West that he's prepared to use nuclear weapons if their forces are used against his country. Now the leader of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, is calling for peace negotiations, saying raising the white flag for talks takes courage. His comments have been sharply rebuked by Ukraine as a call to surrender, but have been welcomed in Moscow. So who's right? Is there merit in what the Pope has said? Is it time to talk? Or should Ukraine, backed by its Western allies, fight on? And do the Pope's views reflect thinking on the Ukraine war beyond Europe and the US in the so-called Global South? We'll be discussing this and more with our guests in just a few moments. But first, this report from Imogen Kimber on what the Pope actually said and the reaction to his remarks. Pope Francis, the leader of the Catholic Church, has urged an end to the Ukraine war and the start of negotiations. It's a position differing from Ukraine, the US and its NATO allies in the European Union. The word negotiate is a courageous word. When you see that, you're defeated. When things aren't going well, you have to have the courage to negotiate. One may feel shame, but how many will end up dead from this war? And he criticised the argument of self-defence. You say that you have this responsibility to defend yourselves. But then you realise that they have to bomb the others. That's not defending, that's destroying. And look what a war brings. Death, destruction, children without parents. The Pope's views have been sharply criticised in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky alluded to the Pope's comments saying, all religions in Ukraine are united in fighting Russia. I thank every Ukrainian chaplain who supports the army. This is what happens when the church is with the people, not two and a half thousand kilometers away, somewhere to mediate virtually between someone who wants to live and someone who wants to destroy you. The Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitro Kuleba, said that a strong person should stand with the good rather than negotiating. Criticism of the Pope's comments also came from Poland's foreign minister, Latvia's president and the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Turkey, which has good relations with both Russia and Ukraine, has again offered to mediate talks. And a peace summit is being planned in Switzerland without Russia being invited. We do not see Russian representatives at this summit. We do not see how we can invite people that destroy and kill everything. We want results. We want a just peace, a just peace for Ukraine. So first, the civilized countries of the world will develop a plan, achieve a result, and then involve representatives from Russia, those who are ready for a just peace. Ukraine's leader maintains that peace will not come at the cost of any of his country's sovereign territory. But on the battlefield, there's little movement on the front lines. A planned Ukrainian offensive last year made little impact on heavily defended Russian lines. President Vladimir Putin's forces hold parts of the east and Crimea, which was annexed in 2014, and repeatedly launch missile and drone attacks on Ukrainian cities. Political battles in Washington could have a big say on what happens next. There's growing opposition from US Republican politicians to the high cost of funding the war. Who wins the US presidential race may also have a big impact with Ukraine and its European allies fearing what might happen to NATO and US support if Donald Trump wins re-election. Imogen Kimber, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our panel now in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. 
We have Volodymyr Yermolenko, he's chief editor of Ukraine World, which aims to explain Ukraine's politics and society to an international audience. In Russia's capital, Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer is an independent Russian foreign policy analyst. And in the English city of Bath, Patrick Bury is a defence and security analyst, a senior lecturer at the University of Bath and a former British Army officer. Welcome all to Inside Story. And Volodymyr Yarmolenko, let me begin, as is appropriate in this discussion, with you. And I want to just remind you of Pope Francis's comments in that interview with Swiss television aired on Saturday. He urged the parties to negotiate and to do so, quote, before things get worse. And he said that Ukraine should have the courage to raise the white flag. Your response to that? Well, uh, it's, it's uh, of course, inappropriate to, for, uh, for Pope to say that Ukraine has to have courage to raise the white flag because it was read in Ukraine as the as a call for capitulation and for surrender and it's indeed very very strange to hear these words from uh, from the Pope from the chief of the church who is actually ha has to have just a very clear vision of what is good and what is evil when when a country like Russia enters Ukraine and, and bombards everyday civilians kids and and women and elderly and uh, and residential houses and believe me i know what i'm saying because i've just returned from kherson which is a city on the front line i go to the front line every every month and uh, several time, times per month i i see the the suffering of the ukrainians ukrainians want peace of course they want peace much more than than anybody else in the world but they want just peace they want not occupation that they, they want not russian occupation not russian forces who would just put uh, people in the in the in, in the uh, in the in, in prison and torturing them what is happening right now on the occupied territories and i do think that people like pope francis have to be aware of that mm. well the comments nevertheless uh, were warmly received in moscow pavel felgenhauer the kremlin giving them uh, their thumbs up, uh, Turkey offering to mediate talks. The global south is in favour of an end to the war. They've seen their economies affected, global food security uh, in jeopardy. Uh, but in terms of where President Putin stands on this, he may want to talk, but there's no sign whatsoever of him being willing to give any ground at all, let alone try to find some middle ground in talks. Uh, well, from beginning of this war, more or less, uh, from at least March uh, 22, uh, the Russian Kremlin official position was basically that, yes, a kind of in, uh, ceasefire was very much possible. Uh, President Putin mentioned recently again that there was a tentative agreement achieved in March 22 in talks in Istanbul, in Istanbul between uh, Russian and Ukrainians, and that that would be a basis, could have been a basis for a uh, more permanent ceasefire. Apparently, based on the mm, more or less line of control as it is, or as it was then, or as it is right now. So that's what uh, Russia would want. Uh, and uh, yes, also, of course, uh, pledges of Ukraine decreasing its military and uh, not, uh, pledging not to ever join NATO, and that that would be sufficient to kind of call it a ceasefire for the time being. It's also known as the so-called uh, Korean uh, 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 plan, like in, uh, uh, in Korea, to have a ceasefire based on the line of control, uh, more or less like that. So, yes, that's something that Russia would want. Ukraine refuses to accept, believing that this could be only a temporary solution, like the, and that the, uh, it would give Russia a pause for preparing its forces for maybe another uh, live attack, a serious attack coming up. But of course, a ceasefire, as they say in Russia, or well, there's a saying, Sorry, a crooked piece is better than a good fight. So yes, there it has its merits to kind of call it a day right now, then continue this 
pitched battle that's right now seems to be going nowhere. Well, it's probably worth remembering before I bring in Patrick Bury that that line of control in terms of a crooked piece that you describe involves Ukraine giving up sovereign territory, territory that was in nobody's doubt was Ukraine's before 2014. Patrick Bury, uh, before we talk more about the substance of the war and the pros and cons of fighting on, Bring us up to date. Give us a sense. I know it's a big question, but give us a sense of where the war actually stands. Ukraine has lost some ground recently. There are signs of Russia advancing in some areas. The tipping point seems to be Ukraine's dire shortage of ammunition and longer range uh, missile weaponry. Yeah, that's correct, John. I think, you know, to, to quote Vladimir Zelensky, Russia has won the winter, um, which he, you know, is a good way of summing it up. Uh, it hasn't had an operational level breakthrough. It's not really how it's been fighting recently. Um, and it's hard to achieve a breakthrough to mass for it in, uh, in secret because there's so much surveillance with drones and satellites, et cetera, these days. So the defensive form of warfare is ascendant. It's hard to break through, but in that within that paradigm, uh, the initiative, the momentum is with Russia at the moment. There's been this time lag of the Western aid coming in. It should have started coming in in September, October, you know, and and Russia essentially put its economy on a 75 percent war footing. Um, it's starting to churn out stuff in terms of military equipment and get some uh, get into a groove militarily. It's also learning. It's starting to learn, which it wasn't doing in the early stages of the war. Um, so that's so, so the Ukrainians are under pressure, but it hasn't broken yet. And the question is, can the Russians mass and break through somewhere in the coming months or not? Um, but they are putting them under pressure. On the plus side for the Ukrainians, they basically destroyed or damaged a lot of the Black Sea fleet, forced the commander to be relieved. And they're getting the grain out from, from the south, which is good. Um, they've done, they seem to push forward uh, air defense assets and taken out a lot of Russian fighters and other strategically valuable aircraft recently. And uh, they may have though, lost some Patriots I'm reading recently as a result of doing that, and they're highly valuable too. So the Russians are getting into a better targeting um, loop, as it were, tightening that time. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's hanging in the balance. But the crucial thing is, is this aid. You know, we've yeah. essentially the West, the Russian steal a march. The West just not doing what it's promised to do and certainly not doing it quickly enough. So a picture there of sort of slow-moving front lines, a grinding attritional war. Uh, Pavel Felgenhauer, the attitude in Moscow would be what? Short of peace negotiations, that, that Russia has more men, it has more weaponry, it has more time, and that Ukraine is running out of all three. Is that about right? Well, of course, Russia is a much bigger country and it has a much bigger population and uh, a much bigger defense industry uh, inherited mostly from the Soviet Union. And also, of course, Ukraine is under Russian long-range attack. Russian missiles can hit any target in any part of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine does, uh, cannot hit that deep into Russia, though they have been increasing their attacks using uh, mostly homemade drones uh, attacking deeper into Russia. R Russia there has an advantage, though the Russian Air Force does not fly through over the front line. It doesn't attack in Ukraine as, say, the Russian Air Forces did in Syria after 2015, where they were highly effective, that's not working in Ukraine. Okay, uh, that's a, that's also a very serious problem. So both sides have problems. On both the sides have problems. Vol Volodymyr, yes. take, take that the... that's why there's a that's why there's a, 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 a stalemate because both sides have serious problems. V Volodymyr, I want to ask you about additional problems that may exist within Ukraine that perhaps the Pope speaking about them, opens a debate that people are thinking but not necessarily saying. I want to ask you about tensions within Ukraine, within Ukrainian society, because I've been there and I've seen the vibrancy and the energy of life in the big cities and the bars and the cafes that are packed full of people, and I've seen and heard the tensions exist between people who are willing to lay their lives down and go to the front lines and people who perhaps are less willing. Is there a creeping sense of pessimism now in Ukraine that perhaps this war is not winnable? 
Well, of course, tensions exist, and they will always exist in a society which is in the war. Because uh, on the one hand, you have uh, a big consolidation of the society. But on the other hand, you definitely have you know, all these cracks within the society that you just described, because uh, everything depends on the level of, of personal investment and per personal sacrifice. And of course, this is very different, different depending on the family, depending on, on, on a personality. But frankly speaking, um, I don't see uh, that fatigue and that exhaustion that sometimes is like imposed on Ukraine or present in, in, in some foreign capitals when people are talking about this fatigue. I see the decisiveness of the Ukrainian society. I see the the readiness of the people who are not on the front line to uh, contribute with their resources, with their time, with their volunteering work uh, for for the victory. And I personally just can testify that we are doing a lot of volunteer work to help the army as civilians, and I don't have I don't find any problems when I, for example, try to get donations from, from the people. Now, coming back to this uh, war question, we need to understand very, very clearly that uh, Russia can say, of course, that let's negotiate, let's have this Korean scenario, whatever else. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that this is all a game from the Russian side. This is all this, uh, and this, is all this uh, geopolitical disinformation, because uh, obviously they want partition of Ukraine. And this is what they clearly said. They they want partition of Ukraine or they, they want really to control Ukraine's sovereignty. And they want to go farther. They want to um, have much bigger plans. And they clearly say these plans in, in their propaganda about Europe, about other parts of the world. The modus operandi of the Russian empire is that it is expanding. It tries to expand constantly, militarily. And when it is not expanding, it has a fear that it will collapse. This mm. is what is driving for. So it's not, not a question about this particular territory, this particular town. We need to understand that this is this driving force in the Russian expansionism, that um, these borders, the new borders that Russia wants to join, that they will not be stable. Russia wants to go farther and farther again. OK, well, we, we'll come to that question with Pavel in just a moment. But as you said, staying with the war, what I really want to ask you is if you won't countenance the idea of negotiations, and, you know, it's easy to understand why, can you draw a line from this point towards a point where Ukraine forces Russia's capitulation on the battlefield? Can you see that happening? Well, it all depends, of course, on on the willingness of uh, of the Ukrainian people, but also on the willingness of of the of the partners of Ukraine. Now, we 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 don't see uh, that much engagement uh, of the partners. You mentioned the the American problems, but um, but at the same time, we see the increasing like wake up uh, in in Europe. I think with regard to the Russian invasion, because. Europe also understands that uh, Russia presents a imminent threat, security threat for itself, for its own, for its own, for its own unity, and uh, we actually we don't know what what will happen, what will happen in the future, and uh, what will happen in Moscow, what will happen with the Russian establishment. Uh, everything is possible, and I do think that uh, at least that Ukrainians. Uh, when they deny the Russian efforts to just destroy uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and Ukrainian territorial integrity, that will be a huge blow for these imperialist ideas of Russia. Because really, I mean, when we're talking about problems of the Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive, it's clear, and uh, your guest already also said that, it's clear that Russia has huge problems as well with this huge mm. army, and it's losing so much people on the ground. And uh, frankly speaking, for the Russian society, I just don't understand why it's not happening. Putin is killing as many Russian citizens as Ukrainian citizens, mm. uh, or even more. And that, I, is, that, that should be a huge moral problem for the Russian society. Well, it, it does, I mean, if you'll forgive me, it does rather sound as though a lot of what you're saying is hopeful rather than necessarily pragmatic and realistic. Let me put the question to Patrick Bury. Do you see a line from this point towards Russia's capitulation on the battlefield, given the divisions among the NATO allies, given the 
evident inability of President Biden to release the $60 billion aid package this side of the election, or indeed no guarantee it'll happen afterwards either. I mean, if the situation stays the same, it's it's very difficult to see that. I, the, the path to victory for Ukraine would be, uh, obviously, the aid coming in immediately um, and uh, a large round of mobilization. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Western support this year go on the defensive uh, and build and have another crack, uh, a larger, more better planned, uh, longer trained crack against the Russians in a certain sector next year. But what you're looking for from that is an operational level breakthrough, which takes back, like we saw, a chunk of uh, territory um, similar to maybe the um, the Kherson or Kharkiv offensives. But the I mean, situation that... on the battlefield is much more difficult to do that. But that is probably realistically their best option, unless something changes politically in Russia, which looks like it's locked down. So it's. I mean, they may have see. they may have F-16s flying by next year, for instance. But you know that still gives us the best part of twelve months of this grinding attritional warfare that everybody's got to withstand. Yeah, F-16s aren't. You know, you you need a whole system behind that in terms of how you deploy mm. them and the, the logistics and all that. They're not. That they're a certainly really useful asset, and we'll see how they do. Um, but the Russians have good air defence as well, so. You know, it, it's a way to see it. it. It will help. It will certainly give them air cover, and that's probably what you're waiting for. Do do it again, bigger, longer trained, but with air cover, and hopefully you can get through. No quick but fix, as we've certainly seen. There, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pavel, uh, let me bring up that question that Volodymyr raised a moment ago. It's the question of appeasement. It's history is pretty instructive. Let's say on what happens when you appease an aggressor. The idea of negotiations, the idea of giving in to Putin. Does he want to go further? Does he want more? Does he want to expand his appetite for post Soviet conquest? Mm, well, there are different voices coming out of Moscow and different opinions. Uh, maybe it would be, there, many would like that to happen, but I don't see that very, very much realistically because the a two-year conflict with Ukraine, and there's no right now immediate end to that in sight, has uh, seriously uh, curtailed the Russian fighting capabilities, at least for any offensive action. It will take years and years after this conflict ends in any kind of meaningful way for Russia to be as ready for offensive action and as it was when it all began in February 22. Right now, of course, it's again March, and that means it's uh, springtime coming, and therefore a couple of months it's going to be no major offensive actions are possible because there's going to be a sea of dirt. Then comes the, fight, the summer fighting season, extended summer fighting season, where both sides will try to uh, knock a serious blow on each other, maybe possibly break through. Russians would want to break through and then the war. The Ukrainians would want to break through and then the war. That most likely may happen or may not, and it will be another summer or it may be another summer of indecisive bloody stalemate. Uh, but the war is not ending then, uh, most likely. And uh, But after, if, if next year it will be again a bloody stalemate, most likely the calls for some kind of negotiation on the basic uh, basis of status quo will become stronger. And, and, and that could end this conflict. Pavel, before I give the final word to Volodymyr, just, just update us on the sense that the Kremlin has or Putin has uh, that sanctions are biting, that he wants to be released from this isolation in global affairs. How much of that plays into the idea that negotiations uh, well, are, are something Russia he may want? That, officially, Russia says that everything's OK, sanctions are not working, we are uh, adapting. Russia is adapting, and a lot mm. of things are being done successfully, but there are serious and growing problems and also with defense production uh, to, uh, the, to produce enough weapons and actually new weapons. So yes, a uh, pause is needed. I think that's understood. And some kind of end for, the, for this fighting should come. Okay. 
Uh, Volodymyr, I, I want to put this to you. Among the Pope's comments were these, speaking about conflict in general, including Israel's war on Gaza. He said, negotiations are never a surrender. It is the courage not to carry a country to suicide, which begs the question to you, how far is too far in defending Ukraine under these circumstances? No, but l let me readdress the question. So if we are talking about negotiations, how is that different with what happened in 2014 and 2015 when we had negotiations with Putin and when we had you know, peace agreements and then Putin violated these peace agreements and uh, accumulated his forces forces and went farther? And let us, uh, you know, come back to history. Uh, if you think about history, if you look at history, you know that every partition of Ukraine leads to partition of Poland, for example, and uh, and uh, the Baltic states and Russia's further entry in into the into the European continent. This this what happened in 17th century. This was happened in in the 20th century. Even more so, the partition of Ukraine and then partition of Poland in the 20th century led to partition of Germany, for example. So, and the question is, okay, Russia is very weak and it will not move forward. Well, lo let's look at the early 20th century. During the Bolshevik time, Russia was really, really very weak after the mm. First World War. But then it accumulated its forces and just divided Europe into two parts after the Second World War. So I think the, the, the real question should be whether we are able to stop Putin, who is a new uh, 21st century fascism, which is really changing the rules of the game around the world and making any borders of any state really unprotected. Or we can't, we don't stop him now, and therefore the world in the 21st century will look very, very different compared to the uh, previous decades. I'm going to thank all my guests now, uh, Volodymyr Yarmolenko, Pavel Felgenauer and Patrick Bury. And thanks to you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Jonah Hull and the whole team here, goodbye for now.